So um, I'm super excited to uh, introduce Don Cruz, who's a fishery biologist with Lummi Natural Resources Department. Um, this is one of uh, two sessions. The next one will also um, focus on Cherry Point. So um, we're just taking a moment to kind of focus on some of the <clears throat> neat activities that are going on up um, sort of in the Northern County area at Cherry Point. Uh, Don Cruz is a stock assessment biologist working for Lemmy Natural Resources Department and has been working in the field of salmon stock assessment for over 17 years. He has a bachelor's degree in environmental and resource management from Western Washington University. He grew up near the beach, only a few miles north of Birch Bay and is an avid fisherman, clammer and crabber and has a profound professional and uh, personal interest in marine resources of the Salish Sea. So, Don, uh, I'm assuming you have a presentation. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm... Uh... And if you need help sharing your screen or anything like that, let me know. And while you're getting that started, um, I would also add for participants, feel free to add any questions that you have at any time in the chat box, and we'll try to get to those at the end of the presentation. All right, do you see it there? I can see the... Presentation, yeah, it's not in presentation mode yet, though. Perfect. All right. So, I guess today here I'll be presenting on the use of light traps. F5. F5. I'm having some issues here. Do the slideshow stuff. Yeah, we can we can see your. Um, it's not in presentation mode yet. Yeah, we just see your PowerPoint. If you click the slideshow tab. Um, at the top. Yeah, that's not showing that's up not on right here. Oh, interesting. Sometimes if you exit share screen and then retry it, it sometimes helps. Yep. Oh, wait, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah, go to the one bottom left, that one. Yeah. Uh, Yay, that looks there great. There you go. Yay. All right, take it away on light traps, please. Okay, sorry. Doing this on the laptop, and I'm used to doing it on my regular desktop here. So, um, so I'm presenting today on the use of light traps to assess larval cherry point herring and Dungeness crab. Um, some of the results I'll be presenting on were already previously presented by the Washington Department of Natural Resources, and they also provided some of the pictures and images. Um, and for some reason, it is not going to my next slide. If you just click on the right there where you're hovering, you should be able to just click on that. There you go. Ah. Okay. So I'm just gonna go over the general details about cherry point herring, light traps we use and what we caught. So why cherry point herring? The cherry point herring are a genetically distinct stock and they're the latest spawning stock in the Washington portion of the Salish Sea. They spawn all the way into June. Most other stocks uh, spawn from late January through late March. Uh, WDFW has been tracking the population and estimating its biomass since 1973 when the biomass was estimated to be 13,606 tons. As of 2016, that biomass was estimated to be 468 tons, which is a 96% decline. It was Washington's largest herring stock from the mid 70s to the mid 90s. Uh, they historically spawned from Portage Bay, which is kind of all the way just on the west side of Bellingham Bay, all the way up to Point Roberts, so west of you know, Boundary Bay. Um, past few years, however, the spawning has only been taking place up in this small portion of uh, Birch Point. So a uh, pretty um, dramatic decrease in the amount of area being used to spawn. Uh, the herring are important part of the food web and important prey species for um, protected species like Chinook salmon and the resident killer whales. 
And they've also been an important food source for the Lummi and other Coast Salish people for thousands of years. Uh, another thing to note is that you might see um, some places that I'll show calling this Birch Head or Birch Point. It's just names are used interchangeably here. So how did Lummi get involved? Um, Cherry Point herring are an important are important to the Lummi people culturally and commercially. They've been a food source for thousands of years, and more recently, the herring and their roe uh, were harvested commercially. Commercial harvest stopped, however, in 1996. Um, LNR, or Lummi Natural Resources, had already exper had experience using light traps in an attempt to correlate juvenile Dungeness abundance with harvestable adult abundance several years down the road. So we did that from 2017 to 2019. So with this experience, it made it made sense for us to pair with DNR on this project. Uh, personally, I'm interested in these fish because I grew up just you know around the corner from Birch Point, and you know we used to jig for these herring in May and use them for bait, and then you know all of a sudden it's like we can't do that anymore. And I've always been interested in why they have declined. Um, you know, talking to like my elders around the Blaine area and everyone's got their theories. So hopefully someday we know. Um, sorry here, I'm having issues. All right, well that is it for me. We go. So, why the decline? Um, the key point, I guess, is there's no smoking gun. Um, there's a lot of possible causes, but not any single one seems to really explain the decline on its own. Climate change is an option. Um, they should be more resilient to climate change than other stocks because the embryos have higher temperature tolerances. Habitat loss, well, that doesn't really appear to be the case either because there's been no decrease in the available spawning habitat. Um, it doesn't appear to be habitat, habitat limited. But however, the cherry point herring appear to have switched where they spawn or what they spawn on. They're now spawning on sargasm, which is different from the eelgrass and other algae varieties they historically spawned on. Um, disease. It appears they may be more susceptible to certain parasitic infections. Industrial activities, including dock construction and operation, um, dis outcharge, dis or outfall discharge, increased vessel, vessel traffic, accidental oil spills, noise pollution, introductions of non-indigenous aquatic species resulting from ballast water discharge, um, Predation appears to probably be the worst threat right now since the spawning is retracted to such a small area and the sargasm they spawn on floats, which makes um, the spawn close to the surface at low tide, which is really easy for a lot of uh, diving birds to prey on. Uh, there's a lot of data gaps for larval herring. Uh, little is known about their survival rates, abundance, dispersal patterns, and predation. So why light traps? Um, based on insect research, light traps were tested in Oregon. And uh, it seemed logical that they would also work for marine organisms as well. These are the standard light trap design used by the Pacific Northwest Crab Research Group or the PCRG. Uh, the funnel size is just large enough to let in the juvenile fish, but not large enough for most predators. The lights are controlled by a timer and turn on and off roughly at dusk and dawn. The weights we use are about five pound diving weights connected to the bottom of the trap. So it'll just kind of keep it upright in the water. Um, for buoyancy, you know, the buckets themselves float on the top, and then they're also connected to a, like an inflatable buoy ball and then a crab pot buoy. And then those are all connected to a 50 pound anchor that's sitting on the bottom. 
So why did we select these locations? Um, well, the spawning in recent years has been taking place right up along, you know, this kind of edge of Birch Point, where for a lot of years, a lot of the spawning was down along Point Whitehorn and Cherry Point. So we wanted to kind of monitor the expected points for a larval dispersal near the spawning locations based on, you know, WDFW's uh, spawning ground survey data. So we've got kind of their typical kind of spawning areas here, and there's a lot of current that moves along here. So theoretically, these uh, larval fish would get kind of moved past our traps. And then inside Birch Bay, it's kind of an eddying effect. And we assumed that, uh, you know, it would be a good area for those to kind of settle out in the bay there and hopefully be captured in our traps. So our, our survey design, we started kind of, uh, I guess we deployed them in early April. Um, we started out checking them twice a week, but then increased to three times a week for the majority of the sampling. The batteries would usually last for at least two nights out there so we could check them just like every kind of third day. Um, the light was programmed around roughly for about eight hours of fishing time, you know, between dusk and dawn. Um, and then the Department of Natural Resources staff and LUMMI staff alternated and coordinated on the checks and the deployments. Uh, the catch was just emptied into tubs or buckets and sorted out um, herring and Dungeness crab, and then also other a variety of organisms. And then the counts of uh, kind of our non-target species were just generally roughly estimated since some of them were uh, very numerous. We also attempted to evaluate the uh, efficacy of, uh, or of the light traps by doing kind of comparative toes for ichthyoplankton in the vicinity of the, the light traps, but just to see if, you know, we catch something in the plankton toe that we didn't catch in the light traps, but this didn't really appear to be successful. Could be, you know, the timing, tide, light period, you know, we'll kind of look at a new design for toes uh, for comparison moving forward this coming year. So what did we find? Well, we caught 58 herring, um, all kind of larval and juvenile. We also caught 181 sand lance, which we weren't really expecting to catch too many sand lance, but they are pretty abundant in the area out there. So, um, and we'd caught those in our other kind of light trap work Lummi had done before too. So not a, not a ton of herring. Most of those were caught just over the course of a couple of our sampling events. So, Based off of the WDFW spawner surveys, the, the size we expected cherry point herring to be based on kind of egg deposition and timing. The herring we caught were most likely uh, kind of too large to be these uh, cherry point herring. They were more likely from uh, semi-ammo stock or one of the other earlier spawning stocks that spawn, you know, a couple months earlier. So as you can kind of see, we... <laughs> probably only maybe caught one or two that could have been the cherry point stock of herring. So sand lance, you know, we're, in a, oh, we're another important kind of forage fish species we found in the study area. There's no documented spawning ground for the sand lance in the area, but, you know, Birch Bay is a, probably a pretty good area for them. Um, they are quite common in the area too, and we also caught, like I said, a lot of them in Lummi's light trap work before. They seem to have an affinity for the light traps. So here's kind of a, a variety of what else we caught. We caught a lot of uh, different things. We caught obviously herring, uh, some juvenile or larval sculpins. These are likely lingcod, we got sand lance. We caught chum salmon, this guy, which may be a comb fish. Caught quite a few sticklebacks and then flatfish and gunnels. And so we got quite a variety of uh, 
of different fish. We also caught a lot of uh, polychaete worms and amphipods that uh, seem to really be attracted to the traps too. Then we of course caught Dungeness crab larva. So we went out in search of larval herring and expected to also catch some uh, Dungeness crab megalope, which are kind of the free swimming uh, larval phase. But we did not expect to catch a record number of them. So why do we care about crab? Um, Dungeness crab are the highest value catch to the Lummi fleet. Uh, we also don't know a lot about their life histories and which habitats are important to them at kind of different life stages. And we caught a lot more than we were expecting to catch. This is a chart that just kind of shows general value of uh, the catch of crab by the Lummi fleet. And then there's herring, you know, back in the 70s and 80s when Lummi was still harvesting decent numbers of them. So here's some of our crab catch. Um, it kind of varies a lot. This is kind of on the, the logarithmic scale to where, you know, it's tenfold increase every time you go up. So we caught in one night 53,000 uh, crab larvae, which is about two and a half times higher than any member of the uh, crab research group encountered in 2019. Um, we had another night when we caught about 40, uh, 48,000. So what does that mean? These spikes are probably um, from spawning events, you know, crab moving in after they spawned or the larva moving around. Um, they probably are spawning events in the somewhat local area. We don't know for sure, but as a point of reference, you know, if we caught several thousand in Lummi's previous um, light trap work, that was considered to be a really good catch. So, I mean, we caught quite a few um, high catches, you know, in the thousands. And then obviously those two that were very high catches. So um, I guess, what did we learn and what do we do next? Um, we had a few issues this season. Two of the traps were in really exposed locations, the Birch Point and the Point Whitehorn traps, which made checking them pretty challenging on bad weather days. Um, we had a day out there when it was uh, really nasty and not a very big boat. So um, just got to kind of pay more attention to that. Um, there's also the fine line of how much flotation to use on the traps um, with the buoys and the, uh, you know, bucket itself, uh, we actually discovered that they will float the anchor. So <laughs> we went to check one day and the trap is gone and we just luckily on our way back to Lummi found it floating around out off the Cherry Point dock out in the middle of the Strait of Georgia. And then we lost another one a little while later and a Canadian boater actually found that one and shipped the trap back to us again. So after that, we, uh, we doubled up on the anchors and we actually moved the trap kind of inside the corner of Point Whitehorn a little more to keep it a little bit more protected. Um, it appears the traps were getting snagged by logs, especially on kind of stormy days out there. The logs would kind of bump them into deeper water and then they would just float off. So um, we plan on starting again this year in April. Um, We'll likely probably trap a little bit later than we did last year since we caught like a lot of crab larvae up till the end of our sampling or at least go into July. Um, hopefully we can capture more herring this year so we can perform some genetic analyses on them and discover if we're actually encountering the cherry pointer herring that we're actually looking for. Um, try to redesign those ichthy ichthyoplankton toes to try to get a, some better data from those and also we need to look into the crab catch data and see if we can use that data to inform future management decisions since it, you know, really high numbers. And it, it happens that kind of that northern area is a really popular area for sport and commercial fishing too. So maybe we're onto something there. Um, 
So I guess another thing moving forward is Lummi is also seeing a explosion of uh, green crab. I mean, our, our green crab biologists will be presenting here in a while too, but um, 85,000 green crab, I believe were caught last year. And um, I think there's a plan to use light traps to try to assess their uh, kind of larval numbers and distribution in the near future as well. So. That's about it. I guess I'd like to thank you know all of our contributors from uh, the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Great, thank you so much. Um, just a reminder, folks can enter their questions into the chat box if you have any. Um, the we did have a question about whether or not green crab and Dungeness crab compete. At this point, we don't really know for sure yet. Uh, the green crab, I mean, it's just kind of the, the beginning of the invasion there. I mean, the numbers have kind of exponentially increased just the last few years. So um, their larvae, from what I understand, are a lot smaller, so they might not be as easy for us to detect. But we've already had some discussions about kind of keeping our eye out for those this coming year and seeing if we, if we come across any. But we're still in the learning phase of figuring out what to do with those little guys. Of course. Um, response was thank you uh, for that answer. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, um, I'm curious, uh, do you know any, I know that there was maybe a little bit of thought, you mentioned predation um, being a factor and there were some um, exclusion trap set out to exclude birds from um, getting at the um, herring spawn. And I was wondering if you knew anything about that, is that seeming like it's successful or are there maybe other management strategies that could be employed to better help um, with survival of these critters that you're studying? Well, um, we haven't participated much with that, but from what we've heard, uh, those exclusion devices have actually been really effective at keeping the birds off of the, the spawn. But whether or not you can create a, a large enough exclusion device to kind of cover enough of the area to make a, a huge difference is, I guess, to be determined. But it appears that, yeah, those predatory uh, diving birds are, you know, putting the herd on the spawn quite a bit, especially since they're all confined to a small area. So it seems like uh, that may be the trend of the future for trying to just somehow find a way to protect those. Um, hazing the birds is another option, but you know that requires uh, a lot of people and a lot of time. So hopefully we can find a solution here. Great, well, thank you. Um... Oh, uh, we got to thank you for your presentation um, from Birdie. Uh, and uh, Thanks, Birdie. <laughs> so I know I really enjoyed that. I've been hearing about these light traps for quite a while now. So it was really exciting to hear more about what um, kind of data we're getting from them. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to hearing more updates in the future about them and maybe some of the solutions that we can find to better protect uh, crabs and um, and sorry, <laughs> the crabs and herring. I was looking at the comments, making sure I wasn't missing any uh, further questions. So um, I think that it's fine if we end, we have two more minutes until the next session. So if you wanna take a short little stretch break, maybe get up, do some jumping jacks, refresh your coffee or tea or whatever it is. Um, and thank you again so much, uh, Don, for your wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot, so thanks. All right, well, thank you.